Okay, also, if I could have Pastor Rick come up. We have all sorts of announcements this morning. And if I could have Debbie Conley come up here as well, that'd be great. Come on, Debbie. You all know how much we love Debbie. So yesterday, Debbie... um, celebrated her 25th anniversary working with our children's ministry. Hey, we we had to lie to Debbie to get her over into the worship center, but it was a white lie. It was just a white lie. Christians, Christians. A Christian lie. Yes, they do Yes. Sanctified. So we wanted to honor Debbie um, because 25 years working with her kids, I don't know how, how rare you know it is for a children's minister to work for 25 years. It's truly remarkable. Yet last Sunday, I was not teaching, so I was doing the rounds, and I walked through the children's wing, and I heard this gigantic wailing. And I thought to myself, I thought two things all at once. I thought, man, i got to make my sermons shorter. And then I thought, God bless Debbie. For 25 years, she has handled all of that so smoothly. So we just want to tell you we love you. We can't think of someone who we would rather have. Card and an O, of course. So we're going to ask you to commit for another 25 years. <laughs> Rick, you want to pray? Yeah, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for Debbie. She is a gift to all of us and especially to our children and our grandchildren. We thank you for the 25 years she has been with us and may she continue to be with us, Father. But we ask that you would fill her with your Holy Spirit in fresh new ways Give her joy and peace and strength and wisdom like she has had these years. We lift her up to you, Father, for your blessing because we love her and appreciate her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Stay standing. Let's pray. Father, as we gather here, we do know that across the way is our kids and our grandkids. Uh, Even now, they are lifting up their hearts and their minds to Christ Jesus through worship, and soon the word will be taught to them. And we pray for those who are teaching them, that you would empower them, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would enable the gospel truths to flow smoothly through them into the hearts and the minds, receptive hearts, we pray and receptive minds to the truth of the gospel this morning, and young lives would be transformed. We do pray that, Lord. We pray that for ourselves as well as we begin to lift up our hearts and our minds to you. We pray that your spirit would convict us of truths that we need to be convicted of, would enlarge our heart and our, uh, our, our love and our loyalty to Christ Jesus, our King. We trust you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you remain standing for the first song? Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been
strength, my soul is from the spring. That he who lives to be my king once died to be my savior. That he would leave his place on high and come for a sinful man to die. It's strange so much to stand Before I knew my Savior My Savior loves, my Savior lives My Savior is always there for me My God He was, my God He is My God is always gonna be My Savior loves, my Savior lives My Savior is always there for me my God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. This living, dying, let me breathe. My strength, my solace from the spring. That He who lives to be died to be my Savior.
Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom, but this I know. How deep the Father's love indeed. And there is nothing that so demonstrates that more so than the cross of Christ. What we've just been singing about, that you would go all the way to the cross, you would disadvantage yourself completely in order to ransom us, in order to bring us into reconciliation and cause us to be adopted sons and daughters of the king. And this is what we actually celebrate, which is symbolically demonstrated in communion. And so we're gonna take communion this morning. And if you came in and you didn't get a communion packet, uh, raise your hand and we got some guys in the back, some ushers in the back who would uh, be happy to bring you a packet of communion. You gotta raise them high though. No shame. There is no shame. <laughs> well, there's a little bit if you're an elder. And no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Everybody got it? Okay, let's pray. Father, what we hold in our hands, these little pieces of these elements, elements of the new covenant meal, little piece of bread and a little cup of juice, symbolizing the broken body of the Son of God and the spilt blood that was shed so that the complete forgiveness of sins could be complete. Father, we pray that these covenant realities, we would live in them well. We would walk them out in our lives, our day-to-day -day lives. They would dramatically shape our identity and our love for you. So we take these elements rejoicing, Lord, knowing that someday soon we will stand upon a renewed creation. We will look our Savior in the eye. Our faith will give way to sight. And we will rejoice in all that you have done. We long for that day, Lord. But until that day, we pray that our lives would be found tightly connected in deep union with Christ himself. We trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake. Father, with the taste of grace still upon our lips, we pray that we would continue to pour out our heart's affections towards Christ through worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Say that again. Jesus. 
Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Cause nothing else matters. Nothing in this world. Sun, moon, and stars 
Father, we thank you that indeed you never stop working. You are the God who never gives up, the God who is always pursuing our hearts, pursuing our lives so that we can walk in accordance to the ways of Christ. That your word, we pray that your word and your ways would shape our lives, Lord. We would live out the gospel well in the communities in which you've called us to live and to work. And that even when we are walking through very difficult days, and I know many of us are in this season, that you would continue to pour out your love through your Holy Spirit, that you would be the lifter of our head. We trust you for these things, and as we turn our attention to your word this morning, Lord, we pray that your word would find receptive hearts and receptive minds, that you would convict us of sin, that you would challenge us to walk out fully the truth of the gospel. We trust you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated. And the teen ministry, which is the middle school and high school students, you can be dismissed at this time. Good morning. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, guys. It's good to see so many young people walking out the door into the teen ministry. That is wonderful. I love it. Well, good morning again. Here we are into September. Amazing, is it not? You know, when a person is called into a relationship with the Lord of the universe... I don't know if you guys have really just stopped and thought about that for a second in itself, that the Lord of the universe has called you into a relationship with him, not based on your own works, not based on your spiritual discipline, not based on your external righteousness. (laughs) When that settles in on you, when, that, when you give not just mental assent to those realities, but it grasps your heart, it filters its way from your head to your heart, when that hits, when the penny drops on that, 
It should change everything about you. It changes everything. It should change everything about you. And it should dramatically change the way that you live and love one another. Because the call of God on our, upon your life, the outworking of his grace, when that happens, when it, when it hits in you like that, when the penny drops, like I said, uh, 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 several things happen simultaneously. And if we had the time, and we don't because I just looked at the clock, if we had the time, I'd make you turn to all of these passages. You're just going to have to trust me. But when that happens, when all of a sudden you realize the call of God upon my life, he summoned me into a relationship with him, not based on my works, not based on my religious discipline, not based on my external righteousness, but simply by the mercy, of, but simply by his great love in Christ, several things happen all at once. First of all, you're transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That's Colossians chapter 1. You're no longer a sinner in God's sight, but you're a saint because you've been clothed in Christ's righteousness. So that's Luke chapter 15. Um, you're no longer enslaved to Satan, but you're an adopted son or daughter to the king. That's Galatians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 1. You're no longer an enemy of God, but you become his friend. That's Romans chapter 5. I could, we could just keep going. You're no longer striving to prove yourself to God, trying to earn anything with God, but you're resting in the Lord's grace. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. You see, the call of God, and that, man, again, if we had time, I'd go to these places, but the call of God on your life, it completely changes your identity and it enables you to live and love generously. It enables you to respond to challenges and crises in completely different ways than probably before. And today in our text, in, in uh, Genesis chapter 13, you can go ahead and turn there, we're going to see how the call of God on Abram's life changed his core identity. And how, having a new identity, he lives out of that reality and it enables him to love, to live and love generously and to think and live purposefully and creatively. So Genesis chapter 13 is where we're going to be, and we're going to work through the entire chapter. But before we get there, let me bring you up to speed in case you've missed a week or two as you've been enjoying the last couple of weeks of summer break, hopefully. Um, this is, if you've been with us, you know, this is our 12th week uh, in our study in the book of Genesis. And as I said, well, 11 weeks ago, um, when I taught an overview of this book, Genesis is so foundational to our understanding of who God is, who we are, how the world was created, and how we find ourselves in the mess that we're currently in, and, and how we're to respond both to God and to the world itself. The first 11 chapters, the primeval history, traces the themes of creation and fall and the beginning of redemption. But what happens is as you come to chapter 12, you move out of the primeval history and you move into the patriarchal narratives. And that all begins in chapter 12 with Abraham. Well, Abram. His name's not changed until Genesis chapter 17. And last week, we looked at just the, well, we looked at chapter 12, and we saw the call of God on Abram's life. Um, you're in Genesis 13, right? Skip back to Genesis 12. And look at just the first three verses. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And, and as Rick mentioned last week, this is just the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant, which we'll see more of. We'll see the shape and the implications of it more in the, in the weeks ahead. But the Lord calls Abram to leave his homeland, to leave his people, to leave his family and to go forth. And he doesn't know where, but the Lord will show him. And the Lord promises Abraham, who, remember, he's 75 years of age at this point, and he's childless. The Lord promises Abram that he will father an entire nation, well, what's needed in a nation? Land, people, 
He says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you a father of a great nation. So he's gonna have offspring. He's gonna have a land. He's gonna have a great name. He says, I'm gonna make your name great. He will be a blessing in order to bless others uh, through his life. And that blessing, he says, will be extended to the whole fallen world, to all sorts of people, all sorts of tribes and nations and people groups. They're all gonna, anybody and everybody who responds in faith just like Abraham does. And so the Lord tells Abram to go forth, and Abram remarkably responds in faith, and he goes forth at 75 years of age. Let me ask you, have you ever moved to a new city? Isn't it some of the most frustrating things in the world when you move to a new city and you know where nothing is at? And you drive around for half an hour trying to find Walgreens or something, and you just can't find it. It's so disorienting in touch. This is Abram. At 75 years of, uh, of age, he moves forward, trusting the Lord completely. He completely moves forward. No wonder he becomes the paradigm for the man of faith. He takes God at his word, and he moves out with his wife, Sarai, and his nephew, Lot. And they have these, these large Bedouin tents, or what we would call large wall tents, and they they. They move out with all of their livestock and all of their servants and they leave out, they set out from Haran and they make their way to the land of Canaan. And for a while, everything was going good. The Lord appeared to Abram in verse seven and he says, to your offspring, I will give this land. And so Abram builds an altar to the Lord right then. But then a real crisis comes about. And the crisis was, you guys remember this, right? A severe famine hits the land, which means you're unable to access food for your family and your servants. It means you're, una- you're unable to access forage for your livestock. This is a terrible situation. And remember, in that day, there was no government PPP loans. Nobody was going to bail them out. And so Abram makes the tough decision to leave the, the livestock, or leave, uh, leave the land of promise, leave Canaan. He knows he's, gonna, he's being jeopardized, and so he makes the decision, he and Sarai, that they're gonna pack up and they're gonna leave the promised land. And they enter into Egypt because they know in Egypt the Nile River's there and flood irrigation. And there'll be plenty of forage for the livestock. There'll be plenty of food for his family, for his retinue. Now, as Rick mentioned last week, a lot of people think that, or a lot of commentators will say that maybe Abram made a poor decision there. Maybe he sinned in leaving the promised land, not trusting God. But the text doesn't indicate that. Um, the text doesn't indicate that at all. It doesn't seem to indicate it anyways. But what he does next is extremely foolish. It is extremely sinful. Abram knows as he makes his way into Egypt that his wife, Sarai, um, she's a looker, right? She's 65 years old and she's really good looking. Now as I look out at you, some of you are 65, and I'm going to agree with Abram, you're all very good looking. <laughs> but 65, I mean when you live to be 127, you're, you know, you're half your age or whatever. So I mean 65 is the new 25 in, in those days. So she's incredibly good looking, and Abram decides he's gonna ask his wife to lie. He says, when you get into Egypt, I want you to lie. I want you to tell the Egyptian, uh, the Pharaoh and his servants that you're not my wife, but you're my sister. And now, of course, she was his half-sister, but her primary identity relationally to Abraham was that of his wife. And so he convinces her to lie about it because he thinks, because of how good-looking she is, that if they know, if Pharaoh finds out it's his wife, he would kill um, Abram to get Sarai. And so he convinces, he convinces her to lie. He convinces her to sin by having her lie, uh, lie to the uh, Egyptian officials. By the way, ladies, if you're married and your husband comes to you with a sinful plan, a stupid and sinful plan, you don't have to go along with it. Just a word of advice. Sometimes, Women will think, based on Paul's instructions in Ephesians chapter five, that wives ought to submit to their husband in everything. Sometimes women will take that and think, well, I gotta go along with my husband in everything. When Paul says everything, he's assuming that he's speaking to Christian men 
who will put their wife's flourishing spiritually, emotionally, physically, in every area above anything else. So he's not calling wives to submit to their husband's stupid and sinful plans. Does that make sense? You would not believe how many women end up in my office and they tell me what their husband tried to convince them of and they went along with it and I just... No, you, don't, you do not have to go along with sinful plans of a husband. You could say, no, 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 no. That's actually outside of God's will. That's outside of the bounds of um, God's will for my life and your life as well. So you don't have to go along with that. But Abram makes this plan because he's fearful for his life. And so his thinking is, Better that she be defiled than I be dead. Not exactly a focus on the family moment <laughs> from Abram right here. But that was his thinking. That was the plan. And so they went to Pharaoh's officials. They saw that she was beautiful. They praised her beauty. She was taken into Pharaoh's house. And because of it, Abram, doesn't say she, uh, Pharaoh slept with her, by the way, but he, she was taken into his house. And because of it, Pharaoh dealt well with Abram, increased his livestock, increased his servants, until the Lord hit Pharaoh and his house with plagues. Look at, you're still in 12? Chapter 12, look at verse 17. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. Now, we don't know how Pharaoh found out the plagues were in connection with, with Sarai. Um, maybe he put two and two together and said, hey, you know, the common denominator here before the plagues and after the plagues. Didn't have any plagues before she showed up. I have plagues after she showed up. Maybe he put two and two together and made the connection that it was Sarai. And maybe she, at that point, confessed that, yeah, they lied to him. Whatever the case, Pharaoh calls Abram in, rebukes him, and then kicks him out of Egypt. And so Abram and all of his servants, they, they come back, beginning of chapter 13, they come back to the place where they had worshiped the Lord in the beginning, in between Bethel and Ai. They come back to that place, and that whole time he's been traveling. Remember, they're carrying all these Bedouin tents and large families and all the livestock and all that stuff. They're making their journey. It's a long trip, no doubt. All that time he's been thinking. He's had time to process. He's had time to repent of his stupidity. And he comes back, and he starts over with the Lord. He begins to worship the Lord again. He has a fresh start with the Lord. And my guess is, my guess is for many of you, you know that feeling, do you not? Where you've blown it, and you know you've blown it, but you've had time to process it, you've repented of it, and you come back and you worship the Lord like you did at the first. That's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful feeling. And that's where Abram is as we move into our passage this morning. He and his household and all of their livestock, and Lot and his household and all of their livestock are back into the arid land of Canaan. Now, as we pick up the story in chapter 13, what's going to happen is there's going to be a new crisis. It's a much different crisis than a severe famine, but it's a crisis nonetheless. And we're going to see how Lot responds to it and how Abram responds to it, because the way that they respond to it is uh, very instructive for us. So, beginning in verse 1 in chapter 13, here's how the narrator records it. We read So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the Negev. Now, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been in the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there, Abram called upon the name of the Lord. It means he's worshiping the Lord. And Lot, who went with, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Go ahead and stop there. So at this point, these guys, both of these guys, and their families, they're incredibly rich. They're bo both 
Abram and Lot are very rich. And when nomadic people get rich, their assets are liquid. Um, their assets are livestock. That's their business. Their business is in the livestock. That's how they make their money. And they both come to realize, after being back in the land for a period of time, probably a good amount of time, they're back in the land before this happens, they both come to realize, after being back in the land for a good amount of time, that their financial growth has maxed out. Let me ask you, are you a business owner? Do you like it when your financial growth has maxed out? No. No business owner likes it when they see, huh, I can't do any more with my business. I'm at the top level and I, this land won't support it. That's not a good feeling. Meaning they can't get any richer. They can't continue to grow their business by staying together. Because along with not being enough forage in the land, because at the end of verse 7 you'll see, if you look at it, the Canaanites and the Perizzites are also living in the land. So their financial uh, growth, their financial growth is completely capped out. And this leads to a crisis because of the competition for pasture lands. It, that competition for pasture land, it leads to strife. Look at verse 7. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. There was strife. Let me give you a definition of strife because I think it's helpful. Strife, here's the definition out of uh, Webster's Dictionary. Strife is a bitter, sometimes violent conflict or dissension. That's strife. Now, you probably don't have such a large herd that you can't find enough pasture for them. Right? But maybe... You have a bunch of kiddos in one bathroom. <laughs> what happens when you have a bunch of kiddos in one bathroom? Strife. So all sorts of strife happens. Am I, am I wrong about that? No. We have two girls, one bathroom for them, and you ought to hear the strife that happens every morning as they're getting ready for school. All sorts of strife. Tensions arise. Strife ensues. And that's what we have here, but on a much, much larger scale. There's the strife. The herdsmen are bickering back and forth. There's conflict. They're yelling, this is our land. This is our land. Da, 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 da. This land is my land. This land is your land. They're doing the whole thing. They're singing. They're angry with one another. And look at how Abram responds. Verse 8. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife. Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If you take the right hand, then I'll go to the left. That's <laughs> remarkable. I love what Abram does here because this is not, this is not an angry separation. Uh, this, is not a, this is not an angry separation marking the end of the relationship. That's not his intent at all. This was a peaceful separation seeking to preserve their relationship. And we look at this and we think, well, sometimes we look at this and we think, well, you know, it would have been a lot better. It would have sounded really spiritual for Abram to say something along the lines of, look, we're all family. We all worship the same God if we truly love one another. We should be able to find a way to live together in this crowded space. That's how, what we would like to hear. That would sound very spiritual. But you know, the Bible is a whole lot more realistic than that. The Bible is never cynical. Have you noticed that? It's never cynical. It's always very realistic. This is why Paul, in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, Paul says, insofar as it depends upon you, be at peace with all people. Insofar as it depends upon you. Because sometimes peace doesn't just depend upon you. Maybe somebody else is trying to cause a strife. Insofar as it depends upon you, be at peace with all people. That's Abram's intention. And look how far he's willing to go 
to create peace and maintain unity between he and the Lord. How far is he willing to go? Here's how far. He's willing to lay, lay down some of his rights. That's shocking. He's willing to lay down some of his rights. As the elder in, the, in this relationship, in a patriarchal society, he's saying, I have every right to make the first claim. But I'm not going to. In order to maintain peace and unity, I'm going to lay down some of my, my, my rights. That's absolutely remarkable. It's countercultural especially in our culture. It's countercultural. I gotta tell you, the person who is so needed in our world right now is someone who prioritizes maintaining peace. Someone who, ma- who prioritizes maintaining unity because our culture is fueled by strife. Our media intentionally feeds us strife because it's the fuel that keep, keeps their ratings humming along and their advertising dollars hum- pouring in. Be- why? Because strife keeps us glued to our TVs. You think I'm wrong about that? How long has the show Survivor been on the air? How long has the show Big Brother been on the air? See, it feeds us strife. And it fuels their advertising. Because we get glued, sucked into it. The news does this all the time. They intentionally do this because they know it'll keep us through the commercial breaks. We're, we're so angered by something, it'll keep us through the commercial breaks. And it keeps their advertising dollars coming in, pouring in, and they will keep feeding us that. Our politicians do that to us. Why? Because they know it'll fire us up and we'll donate to their campaign. And sadly, some pastors do that. I can't tell you how sick and tired I am of stupid pastors who pretend to be political warriors who get on their Facebook feeds and use divisive rhetoric, knowing that it'll anger you and you'll click like on it, which will increase their advertising dollars. It's ridiculous. Let me give you a piece of advice. If you see someone who claims to be a pastor and they're doing that, here's my best piece of advice to you. Click the button that says unfollow. And don't listen to that junk. If they're not actually telling you about Christ and his grace and his mercy and his love for you, the pursuit of Christ coming into the world to rescue you, if they're not telling you about that, unfollow that nonsense. Our culture is fueled by strife. And what's needed now more than ever, at least in my lifetime, are people who in their relationship within the body of Christ and outside of it are seeking to maintain peace and unity. So let me ask you, not to put too fine of a point on this, but let me ask you, are you willing to let go of some of your regrets? Are you willing to let go of some of your rights? Sometimes. Just sometimes. Are you sometimes willing to let go of some of your rights in order to maintain peace and unity? Are you willing, let me put it another way, are you willing to disadvantage yourself for the sake of another? Because that's certainly what Abraham's doing here. He's disadvantaging himself. He's looking out at the fertile plains. One's way more fertile than the other. And he says, Lot, your choice. You go first. Knowing he's going to know what Lot's going to choose. And he, by doing so, he knows he's going to take a hit financially. So Abram, he makes this tremendous counterintuitive offer. And Lot looks out, verse 10, back to the text. And Lot lifted up his eyes. And he saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the Garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. He looks out of the land, he sees his fertile the lush green pasture, and he says, I'm moving that way. <laughs> and I get that. I've been looking for a piece of variegated property for the longest time. So if somebody would have offered me that, I would have went the same way as well. Um, Lot looks out. He sees this lush green pasture, fertile Jordan Valley, and he thinks to himself, I found a slice of heaven. But note which direction he's headed. He's headed east. Towards where? Sodom and Gomorrah. If you go down to verse 13, 
We're told the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. So he doesn't consider at all the spiritual implications of what this will do for him and for his family. John Calvin on this passage, he said, Lot fancied he was dwelling in paradise, but he was nearly plunged into the depths of hell. It's a good way of saying it. He, has no, he doesn't consider at all the spiritual implications of moving east, moving away from the presence of the Lord, moving into an area like Sodom. He doesn't consider at all what this move will do in his relationship with the Lord. Because, again, Sodom was well known in that culture as a place of wickedness. And they had been living in the land long enough to know Sodom was a wicked environment. But he doesn't seem to consider that. He chooses strictly on sight. And the prospect of attaining greater and greater financial wealth, greater and greater financial growth. So Lot makes his choice, and then we read the second part of verse 11. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Moves his tent just outside of the city. Now, the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes. <laughs> lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward, eastward and westward for all the land that you see I will give to you. And to your offspring forever, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth. So if one can, cuss, if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. And that's a pretty good offer. The dust of the earth, um, how dusty is your house? <laughs> the dust of the earth, my goodness, that's a lot of offspring. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. So the Lord reaffirms the covenant promise to Abram. And by having him walk the land, it's like a, a, it's like a living deed to his property. Everywhere his foot touches will be his ground. Do you guys remember the movie Far and Away? Do you guys remember that movie with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman? It's a great movie. You should watch it after church. Um, it's a really a wonderful memory. Remember, my email is rick at trail.org. Um, no, it's a, it's a really, it's a great movie. In the, the climactic scene of the movie, at the very end of the movie, it's, it kind of chronicles the Oklahoma land rush of um, 1890, 1893, something like that, 1889. And in the end of the movie, Cruz's character, he races to a piece of the land and he holds up a flag. And just as he's staking, the, he, as he's about to stake his claim, he shouts out, this land is mine, mine by destiny. I love that line. It's just a great line. And the, there's this triumphant musical score going on in the background and it helps, of course, at Cruz's good looking. It's a great, it's a great scene. But that, that claim, this land is mine, mine by destiny. That can only truly be said of Abraham because this is the Lord. He says, you walk this whole thing, walk it all. It's all yours. I'm giving all of this to you. Nobody else can truly make that claim but Abraham. The Lord gives him all of the land and he tells him his offspring will be as numerous as the dust on the earth. And Abraham sets up his tent near Hebron he builds an altar there, and he worships the Lord. And the story ends right there. And we'll do the same. Okay, so here's what I want to do. Because you read this and you're like, what in the heck is this about? It's a nice little story about maintaining peace and da-da-da-da-da. Okay, but what's it really about? Here's what I want to do. I want to go back and I want to examine the aim, of, uh, the aim of Lot's heart and the aim of Abram's heart. Because they're set, did you notice, they're set side by side for us to learn from. And so we're going to consider, let's first consider the aim of Lot. What was his aim? What was the aim of Lot? Well, we saw it in the text. Lot chose by sight. 
He looked around at the, at the fertile plain of the Jordan Valley and he thought the best, this was the best way for him to get richer. Now, let me ask you, is there anything inherently wrong with making money? No, of course not. But what does this show us about Lot? His decision, strictly based on sight, what does this show us about Lot? Here's what it shows us. It shows us that money and success were more important to him than two other things. What two things? The promise of God and his uncle Abraham. And, and you can kind of understand it being more important than the promise of God because the promise of God to, to Lot probably seemed abstract. It probably seemed hard to believe. And so he bailed out. And eventually, eventually, we'll see it next week, he, moves, he goes away from the promised land and he actually starts living in Sodom. And sure, he loved his uncle Abram, no doubt, but to Lot, well, business is business. Family's family, but business. Business is business. And so by this decision, he puts his financial growth as more important than the promise of God and his uncle Abram. But he does more than that. You see the phrase in verse 10? I kind of read through it really quickly on purpose. You see the phrase in verse 10 where it says, the Jordan Valley was like the garden of the Lord. You see that phrase? Robert Altler, who is an um, expert in ancient Hebrew narrative at Cal Berkeley, of all places. Um, he's an expert in, in ancient uh, Hebrew narrative. In his commentary on this text, he says what the narrator is saying is that when Lot looked at the fertile plain, he didn't just see a way to make more money. He didn't just see a way to continue his financial growth. When he looked at the land, he saw something spiritual. Something spiritual was going on in his heart. And it was like the garden of the Lord. It was like the garden of Eden. He's looking, which means he's looking to recapture something that was lost. Well, what was lost when Adam and Eve fell? What was lost when Adam and Eve were banished from the garden? You know what was lost? A deep inner confidence. A deep assurance of who we are. A deep assurance of our worth and value to God. We had that in the garden, why? Because we were walking with God. But that was lost in the fall. And ever since then, ever since then, humanity has been trying to prove themselves. We've been trying to make an identity. We've been trying to justify our existence. We're always trying to prove our worth. We're always trying to gain our significance. We're always trying to justify our existence. And that, that's what Lot's doing here. The success and riches, he's looking at this thinking, the success and the riches that I'm gonna be able to do, that will prove my worth. Now listen, we look at law and we think, well, that's a terrible decision. We do it all the time. Humanity does it in a myriad of ways. We all do this all the time. Let me give you an example. I'm giving you all sorts of movie examples today. Here's another one, probably a better movie. Chariots of Fire, right? Everybody has seen Chariots of Fire. You remember that movie? Harold Abrams, the Jewish 100-meter Olympic runner, he trained so hard to win a gold medal, and eventually he did. But he said... He said, I feel that when the gun goes off, I have 10 seconds to justify my existence. What a terrible way to live. I have 10 seconds to justify my existence. Now listen, what's he, what's he saying here? On a surface level, he's saying, I really want to win the gold medal. Well, of course you do. Surface level, I really want to win a gold level. But underneath that, underneath that, you get underneath that, at a heart level, he's saying, I'm trying to dispel my inner emptiness. I'm trying to dispel my insecurity. I'm trying to validate my entire existence. And, and again, we all do that. We all do that. Lot's aim here, his, his heart's aim on money and riches, thinking it will finally complete him. But it won't. And the rest of Lot's life shows that it doesn't. And again, all of us do this in one way or another. Some people go into marriage 
thinking that the person that they're marrying is going to complete them. <laughs> I hope Tria's not in here. Um, <laughs> but they, they go into marriage thinking, if I just marry this person, all of my inner insecurity will go away. I'll never sin again because this person will complete me and they'll make, our life will be perfect together. They'll, they'll give me inner security and deep satisfaction. You know what you're doing to your spouse at that moment? You're putting upon them a weight that they were never intended to carry. You're gonna crush them under that weight. Some people will do that with their children. They'll look at their children and they'll think these children will validate my existence. And you'll, your children will become a, a sense of idolatry for you and you will crush them under those expectations, under your false expectations. Some of you will do it with your career. You'll look at your career and you'll say, if I can just climb the next rung of the ladder, then I'll be complete. Then I'll be happy. Well, what happens if that career doesn't turn out and you get fired from it? You'll be crushed in the process. It'll break your heart. You won't have any motivation for living. We'll do it with sex. We do it in all sorts of ways because we're seeking, we're seeking to satisfy Something that's deep within us, this inner insecurity. Because you're trying to find fulfillment, that which was lost. You're trying to find that which was in the Garden of Eden. You're trying to find fulfillment outside of the Lord himself. Just like Lot, you're looking to something or someone, and you're thinking, that's like the Garden of the Lord. Something that gives you a deep assurance, inner security, apart from the Lord himself. Does, does that make sense? We, we all try to do it in all sorts of ways. We do it with money. They think of Rockefeller. Reportedly on his deathbed, they said, well, how much money is enough? Remember what he said? Just a little bit more. See, we all do this in a myriad of ways. We're chasing after something. We're trying to dispel our insecurity. We're trying to dispel our inner emptiness, and we place it on these things, and we think, well, if I just have that, that'll be like the Garden of the Lord. I'll find the fulfillment and the completeness and the happiness and the security and the satisfaction, all the things my heart really craves, apart from the Lord himself. We do it in all sorts of ways. We're not all that different than Lot. So that was Lot's heart aim. Well, okay. Well, Abram sat side by side. So what's the aim of Abram's heart? That's another question. What's, how much time do I got? Oh, I got 15 minutes. Hot dang. What's the aim of Abram's heart? Well, Abram looks at all the strife and all of the quarreling and all of the competition and he goes to Lot and he says, Lot, it's your choice. Completely your choice. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. Whatever's best for you, Lot. Why did Abram do that? Tim Keller had an interesting point on this passage. He said, uh, Abram had a relationship with three things and he knew he couldn't keep all three. He had a relationship with God, he had a relationship with Lot, and he had a relationship with money. Those were his three relationships. And he could have said to Lot, hey look, Lot, the space, the space here isn't enough for us. The both of us are gonna go someplace else. Someplace else that has enough space that we both can flourish. That way, if he would have done that, he could have kept his relationship with Lot intact. He could have kept his relationship with his money intact. But he wouldn't have been trusting the Lord because the Lord had told him to settle in the land of Canaan. If Abram said, I'm the leader, I'm the elder, you're younger than me, I'm going to choose first. And I'm choosing the fertile ground. Well, he would have kept his relationship with the Lord intact, he would have kept his relationship with money intact. But his relationship with Lot would have suffered immensely because Lot's heart was captivated by riches and by material abundance. So what does Abram do? He gives Lot the choice. He gives Lot the choice knowing what Lot would do. And by doing so, Abram kept his relationship with, with the Lord and with Lot. How? Well, how did he keep his relationship with the Lord and with Lot? Here's how. 
by disadvantaging himself. He disadvantages himself. He knew he was rightfully giving, he was giving away what was rightfully his. He knew he was, I'm completely disadvantaging myself, I'm gonna give away what was rightfully mine. He made the choice based on this order, God, family, and then money. And in this way, Abram loved God with all his heart, and he loved his neighbor, Lot, as himself. Hmm. The first and the second greatest commandments. He loved the Lord with all his heart, <coughs> and he loved his neighbor as himself. That's remarkable. Well, let's ask this question. How was he able to live? Are you guys still with me? Okay, I, I'm just going to keep talking until I see somebody fall asleep. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> uh, well, how was Abram able to live this way? How was he able to love the Lord his God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind? How was he able to love his neighbor as himself? How was he willing to disadvantage himself? Things that we don't even consider. How was he able to live this way? Here's how. First, he takes God at his word. He took God completely at his word. This is what the author of Hebrews tells us. I'm not going to make you turn there, but you can later. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, we read this. By faith, Abraham... When called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. So how was he able to live this way? He took God at his word, and he responded obediently. Secondly, here's, and maybe more importantly, he finds his identity. Not in wealth or status, but solely in the call of God upon his life. He lived, out of the, he lived out of the call of God on his life. He found his real identity not in wealth, not in accumulated status, not on status given to him by birthright, which in a traditional culture is everything. If freedom to say, no, I'm not, I'm not, I don't base my identity on those things. I base my identity solely in the call of God upon my life. And the call of God upon his life dramatically changes his life. How? Well, it freed him from being blinded by wealth. And it enables him to be generous. What a, fr what a freeing reality that would be. To say, you know, I'm not blinded by wealth. Wealth isn't the thing that motivates me. And what that actually does is it frees you to be generous. Which is why he disadvantages himself for the sake of law. It frees him to think purposefully. What do you mean? Well, if Abram knew, if he and Lot were alienated from each other, their enemies, the hostile tribes of the Canaanites and the Perizzites who were living in the land, they would have the upper hand. And Lot didn't seem to care, for he was blinded by his love of money. But Abram knew it was wise to keep a good relationship with Lot. So finding, his identity in, so finding his identity in the call of God upon his life, it enabled him, it freed him to think purposefully. Thir third, it freed him to think and live creatively. It enabled him to think and to live creatively. What kind of culture were they living in? Abram, Abram and Lot, what kind of culture were they living in? This was a traditional patriarchal society. And in a traditional patriarchal society, Age, age, right? Um, seniority and age determined everything. Absolutely determined everything. Abram was the head of the clan. He was the older uncle. He was the head honcho. Lot was his younger nephew. For Lot, or for Abram to give Lot the advantage by letting him choose first, <laughs> it's so counterintuitive in that culture. Nobody in that culture would have believed it. Well, why was he able to do so? Because he wasn't concerned with status. He wasn't concerned with wealth. He was enabled to think creatively and to live fully unto God. So how was he able to live this way? Here's, let me recap. By taking God at his word, by finding his identity, um, by finding his identity in the call of God upon his life, and here's third, by resting in the Lord's covenant promise. He completely rested in the Lord's covenant promise. Again, Hebrews chapter 11, I won't make you turn there. We read this of Abraham. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants 
as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand upon the seashore. Abram hears his promise, the covenant promise, and he doesn't need to strive. He doesn't need to prove himself or earn anything. He simply rests in the covenant promise of God. So how is he able to live this way? Well, he takes God at his word. He finds his identity on the call of God upon his life. He rests in the covenant promises of uh, the covenant promises of the Lord. That's how he's able to live this way. But let me ask you this, because I don't know if you know, Abraham's dead. So it doesn't matter how he's able to live this way. How are you able to live this way? That's a better question. I see how Abraham was able to live this way, but how are you able to live this way? Here's the answer. And I bet you you think I know, you know where I'm going. But the answer is not by looking to Abraham. It's not by looking to Abraham. Because Abraham will fail again. And it will, as we continue to read um, Genesis, we will see Abraham in a couple of chapters. He will fail again and again. So it's not by looking to Abraham. So we don't look to Abraham in order for us to live this way. But we look to the one who Abraham points to. We look to the seed of Abraham, Christ himself, who found his complete identity in the call of God upon his life, who disadvantaged himself, willing, who willingly disadvantaged himself for our sake, and who took God at his word fully. And only, now listen, only when we lift up our eyes and we believe in Christ will we be willing and able to be generous towards others like Christ was generous towards us. What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9? He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. You see, only when you lift up your eyes and you believe Jesus will you be willing and able to be generous towards others. Only when you lift up your eyes and you believe in Jesus, will you find your identity in the call of God upon our, our, the call of God upon our lives rather than trying to prove ourselves? Only when you believe in Jesus, when you lift up your eyes and believe in Jesus, will you finally and fully rest in God's new covenant promises of the complete forgiveness of sins, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And resurrection life is yours beginning right now. Amen. Let me pray, and we'll sing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage, how it unearths the idols of our heart. It gets below the motivations. It gets at the motivation level of our hearts, and we see so much of ourselves in Lot. And we hope, Lord, we pray, actually, that we would see in Abraham the one it points to, the one who will not blow it, who will live this way perfectly, the seed of Abraham, Christ himself, and we would lift up our eyes and we would believe. And by the empowering of the Holy Spirit, we would be enabled to live out the words and the ways of Jesus in this day and in our age, that we would be people who would bring peace and unity, hope, real lasting hope, and joy into the environments in which you've called us. We thank you, we love you, in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand? From the rising to the setting sun His love endures forever By the grace of God we will carry on His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Oh
Father, we thank you that no matter where we go, you are with us. You're guiding us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that we would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, and that you would use us in the days ahead to bring forth gospel hope and gospel life into the communities in which you've placed us. We trust you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.